Can you see it? Yep. Okay. <clears throat> Uh-oh, I went one. <laughs> no, we can't. I, I do have some good news. So let me get back to sharing. <laughs> so. Wow. I have a new granddaughter, everybody. <clears throat> You just turned a half years old. <laughs> yeah, do do a little the the clap. She's doing very well. She they live down in Lynn uh, West Lynn, which is the worst for the smoke. And uh, uh, she uh, anyway, she uh, did pretty well. And uh, okay, I think I got this going now. And they had a, a air quality AQI of over 500 one night. Oof. And so they really had uh, some air conditioners going in their small rooms. So anyway, this is our first and uh, everybody see, see everything okay? Looks good. And uh, so we're you can First, and, and we're, we're going to use this because a lot of you wanted to participate. And we have a, a core group going of uh, oh, researchers oh my God. Uh, exploring the Chehalis River hypothesis together and uh, possibly get people involved in helping us visit some regional museums and, and uh, other, other survey potential down the road. <laughs> and here's my good news. She, she's not very expressive, though. <laughs> right. Sure. Uh, anyway, we're really excited today to have a, a good friend, Pat Pringle, uh, who used to visit us at the uh, Mud Bay site on some of his research by kayak. And, uh, man, uh, for some reason, I, this thing's moving on its own, I hope. Uh, uh, but we'll be talking about this especially for our case, you know, that these floods he's going to talk about uh, and the uh, experience very well might have been uh, uh, ob observed and experienced by uh, megafauna like mammoths, mastodons, and, and, and we're looking at the human aspect of how the first people to come in to the continent of America actually may have experience these because they're actually in dates that more and more the floods that he'll tell you about are in dates that more and more seem uh, to be a time period they feel people have been in the continent. And I sent you the paper co-authored by Vic Cassero who's on with us and I. Um, Vic, did you want to say anything about your map here? I'm putting them on the spot. Vic's uh, dog gate his microphone, is what he says in the chat. Ah. It what? <laughs> his dog ate his dog microphone. Ate the microphone. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so when we were uh, up to a couple of decades ago, the idea was people came in through this uh, corridor, this uh, glacial corridor, mid-continent corridor. But then in the 70s, uh, a Northwest Coast archaeologist 40 years ago, uh, Knut Fladmark proposed, well, they could go from refugium to refugium and do much better here than the sterile environment of the uh, uh, corridor route, which would be, even the lakes would be sterile, probably of fish or anything else. Uh, so down here, you, you, you had the opportunity to fish and shellfish and also some terrestrial animals. One of our members, Randall Shaw, thinks they might have even been basically terrestrial and moving. Uh, a lot of people think they came, and we do, came down by boat. But the first place they could have not seen the ice to the east is generally, even if they went into the Lake Russell area, would be uh, down through the Chehalis drainage. So that's what we're looking at. 
And um, this, this is a bad picture and so general really, but just to give you a quick idea, uh, 18,000 years ago, this would have been heavily glaciated, the Olympics, and uh, certainly Puget Sound. So what we're saying is people did make their way down and this would be pretty good avenue. And as the glaciers melted north, as Patrick was saying, it would have a lot of water coming out through here, but also the glaciers uh, still present on the peninsula. And uh, in the main drainage for this massive river would have been the uh, Black Lake Spillway. Um, this freshwater lake would, is said to be 100 to 150 feet higher uh, than Puget Sound. And it would have been a lot of lakes, not so general like this. So once it did drain, once the ice got back far enough, uh, it, it would have dropped 100, 150 feet. So we kind of want to see where the terraces are, which people might have used to uh, come in to take advantage of resources like mammoths, mastodons, sloths, horses. They just found some horse remains in Puget Sound that are over at Central with Pat uh, Lebinsky horse teeth, uh, as well as uh, extinct bison that there's some sites up north. Um, uh, what happened here? And uh, man is dated to 13,800 years ago. So people were here hunting mastodons. And more and more of this date for this drainage, according to some friends uh, that are working on this of Patrick's might have been 15, 16,000 years ago, not, not 13,000 years ago. Though it still isn't totally determined. But if it was earlier than people at 13,800 years ago, uh, actually could have got into, you know, if it drained into Puget Sound, but they still would have to, they still couldn't go east because of the glaciers, they still would have to get themselves to the south end of this, this series of glacial lakes and into the Chehalis drainage. Uh, these are the four goals and as uh, mentioned by Tyler and he can expand on it if he wants. We're trying to do GIS to see uh, uh, where uh, those terraces were of Lake Russell, the series of Lake Russell series, so we can kind of see where we should look. Uh, and also the landforms in the Chehalis drainage and probably those not severely um, disturbed by the uh, Hamax floods. Did you want any, anything to that, Tyler? Um. Yeah, hang on. So, yeah, we're starting with compiling the available LIDAR data. So that's real high resolution um, laser scans, usually done by uh, an airplane that flies over and they scan down and it can actually see through the vegetation so you can get um, bare earth uh, digital elevation models uh, compiled from all those points that they're collecting. And that'll you know, depending on the resolution can get you like six inch uh, uh, elevation intervals. So it, it'll it show lots of fine details um, that uh, uh, you wouldn't be able to see uh, and would even struggle to see through vegetation if you were out doing a physical survey. Um, so it'll kind of cut through everything above it and let us get a, a real good look at what's, what's there. And we'd have to deal with glacial rebound and other aspects of subsidence too. Uh, and we're looking at the megafauna. We had a student uh, who did the best she could to visit regional museums this summer, even with COVID and lots, lots of other dilemmas, uh, the smoke and, and she, uh, she did a really good job on the Callitz Museum. So we'll, we'll have a report on that. 
and Kathleen's been doing a, a great search. Is Kathleen there? But she's been doing a great search of media and has a special uh, software to find when people reported finding mammoth mastodons in particular. Uh, Archaeologist uh, Scott and Elrique and, and myself, and maybe some students who may be interested at Central are looking for uh, stem points distributions because they're said to be by Jim Chatters, one of our uh, uh, team, uh, said to be uh, actually earlier than Clovis. And then we also uh, want to potentially reach out to. Uh, uh, we want to reach out to the public and have them uh, ask them to bring in certain styles of points if they found them to talk about it, as well as megafauna. So this may be a good thing for Moraine, Moraine, who's a really good ethnographer to help us interview people and find potential little property owners that might be uh, able to let us in on those GIS map reconstructions to, to look over the ground. Um, uh -oh, I'm, I'm having trouble with this, I hope. We can get through it, but uh, anyway, as far as this uh, student, Christina Jellyfish Gomez from uh, the Evergreen State College, she had great success at an area just within our Chehalis drainage, the College Museum. They very much helped her. She recorded, photographed, showed maps of where these things were located. And uh, one piece that really interested me was, uh, I probably should leave my pointer off, is this piece of a facial bone of a ma mammoth. It's a young mammoth. You can see up above his finger where the tusk came out. But those are strange cut marks. Um, and I don't know if a big like predator fauna, like a, possibly a saber-toothed cat, could cut something like that. But it really looks like a knife cut with a stone tool. Hey, hey, Dale, could I interrupt you for a second? Yeah, sure. Um, we are seeing your uh, presenter view which shows, uh, it shows one slide and then it shows what the next slide oh, is too. Oh, okay. And so I'm wondering if we can uh, look at your main screen because the, then the pictures would be larger. Okay. So people could see them better. I'm gonna stop sharing and see if I can go into that screen. Yeah, this would be it. Sorry about that, thank you. Now do you see that? Very good. The main screen? Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's great. And I I had a laser on, but it, it uh... but see all these, these, so I think Scott Williams and myself, maybe Elrique should go take a closer look at this with Jim Chatters, who's our C4 teams person who works for direct AMS to consider samples. She did take samples of broken pieces that were with these specimens, but it's oh, probably better to take it from the actual, actual piece. So if this is human cut marks, and we get a date on this of 17, 18,000, uh, yeah. or whatever date would be very, very interested. And then we have to prove they're human uh, stone cut marks. Um, and this is the main style we're looking for is, and we would ask people in the public, do you have a point that has this stemmed look to it and these crescents and, uh, and even in this tradition, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, we get needles, bone needles like Marm's rock shelter. I think Dennis, David Rice was gonna come in. Are you in here? And these tend to be earlier, in fact, than the Clovis. So they're, they're much more of interest. And they are found throughout the Chehalis drainage, as well as some areas of Puget Sound and into BC. Uh, this is how we know Patrick uh, is, is his research for drowned forests uh, up, up by the, the uh, <clears throat> up by the 
Kukwa site, the Mud Bay Dig. Uh, and he would come by kayak with his, uh, his partner, Joe Martin here, and they would uh, be looking for uh, buried stumps in 2009. And they found this organic horizon that was pretty interesting up, uh, up uh, above Mud Bay and then below Mud Bay down further in the bay, this shell midden area. But uh, he had a Murdoch Trust grant and it was very successful in creating uh, some of these materials for public education, particularly high school students. Okay, well, I'll, there's our, our main site. I just like to say that, um, that Pat is emeritus, Professor Emeritus. We don't have that at South Puget Sound, but at Centralia College, he's emeritus. Uh, of earth sciences, sciences and, and uh, actually has an office, continues to have an office there. He taught from two, 2005 to 2017, and as a, before that was a research geologist at DNR, Geological Survey of Washington, from 1990 to 2005. And at the US Geological Survey Cascades Volcano Observatory, he worked from 1982 to 1990, and he's, he's quite an expert, as you've already seen, in volcanoes, earthquakes, landslide, debris flows. He's also quite involved in radiocarbon dating and tree wearing work. He's done some educational programs on and gotten students with hands-on experience doing tree ring analysis. Uh, he's authored several, uh, he's authored books on the roadside geology of Mount St. Helens and Rainier. And in several, he's published several papers and reports and, and uh, his Mount Rainier book won the Geoscience Information Society's Best Guidebook Award for 2009, uh, the year he was visiting us at Mud Bay. So, uh, I, I think I better let him get going here. And uh, we certainly appreciate your work with us because you're probably the best, you probably know best the uh, Chehalis drainage part of the whole puzzle. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna, and we're gonna see if, uh, we're gonna make sure that uh, my presentation is also in full presentation mode here. And uh, let's see if this works. Yeah. Now, no, I'm seeing the presenter view again. Hold on. That's not right. Do you see that? I saw it on my screen. So I think what I'm going to do is get out of PowerPoint. Uh, Pat, we were getting the full screen view. Oh, you guys were? Yeah. Oh, I yeah. see. Well, okay. I'll go back. I'm really? sorry. Let me, let me start all over again. I'm glad to hear that. He's... Probably better this. Better. Still, still getting the full screen view then. Everybody see yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. George. Great. Okay. You know, maybe, maybe because I'm a co-host, I was seeing your presenter view, uh, Dale. But anyway, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about this flood, and I thought this would be a good thing to present to the society in the context of the Chehalis hypothesis, uh, because. Um, this flood we discovered, and we've never actually written a paper about it. We've published uh, abstracts and posters for 20 years now on this, and we're very eager to, to finally get a paper out. Um, but uh, I'll be talking about this flood and what it did to the landscape and how it, uh, how it bears on uh, early peoples who came into North America, or may or may not. Uh, but I think you'll find it very interesting. And so uh, that's Barry, my uh, co-author and co-researcher on this, uh, and he's uh, playing my Gibson guitar quite a few years ago. Let's see here. I can't advance unless I'm in PowerPoint. Okay. All right. Now, um, so here's a close-up of the flood. If you've been to the Mima Mound Center, uh, Interpretive Center, you've probably seen this on there because it turns out we've discovered a connection with the Mima Mounds. And that connection isn't so much the mounds themselves, it's the sediment in the mounds. 
And the fact that they're very rich in andesite, uh, a type of rock you find in the Cascade Range and Mount Rainier, that's the main lava of Mount Rainier. So I'll be talking about this flood that came out of a lake that was dammed up against the Puget lobe of the glacier uh, about 17,000 years ago. Okay, so uh, here are some big ideas uh, that I'm gonna try and focus on during this presentation. Uh, the glaciation, the Vashon glaciation, and the ice age floods from it, and the outwash from it. Um, deposits, landforms, and erosional features that are evidence of this flood that we found uh, and other late glacial floods. I'll mention those too because this wasn't the only flood of water at the end of the ice age. And then I'll talk at the end about the timing of this event and uh, radiocarbon dating, calibration of dates and implications for early Americans. Okay, so looking at uh, this digital elevation model for the state, you can see that the fuchsia color or pink color there shows, uh, and I'll see if I can put this. Uh, now I'm using a red laser pointer. Yes. And I know that red, uh, there's a red color blindness. Somebody, somebody may not be able to see this. So uh, if you can't see the red laser, you might wanna type in the chat window and let the moderator Dale know. And in that case, I will go back to the pointer. But uh, I tried the green pointer, but it does the green laser, but it doesn't really work too well on my pictures. So you can see this flood. You can see where I've drawn in just the terminus of the Puget Lobe ice and and how far the flood went. And I'll also mention that a number of students have worked on this. Students from uh, uh, University of Puget Sound, Zoe Futornik, Matt Hahn, Brittany Parker, and Sandra Tanji, and also Isaac Pope most recently at Centralia College, who's been working on it with me this summer. Okay, so uh, you may have heard of the Great Ice Age floods, or sometimes called the Missoula floods, and this U.S. Geological Survey map shows those floods. These were colossal floods that happened. There were a number of these, probably 40, maybe even 80 or 100 of these floods, but we know for sure at least 40 of these floods happened at the end of the Ice Age when a uh, a lobe of ice had come down through into Montana and Idaho here and dammed up the Clark Fork River and it dammed up the valley that Lake that Missoula Montana is in and formed Glacial Lake Missoula so that was uh, 500 cubic miles of uh, of water uh, that's something like uh, let's see that'd be four times that um, 2,000 cubic kilometers of water roughly uh, and that uh, water periodically would float the ice and rush out across Idaho, uh, through Spokane, and across the eastern part of Washington. And of course, eventually it carved out the channeled Scablands, but that flood also went down the Columbia. Uh, it back flooded all the way to Eugene, Oregon, and then went out uh, the Columbia River. So between tw 15 and 20,000 years ago, uh, there was a lot going on in eastern Washington. Well, this flood that we're talking about is very similar to that. Great Ice Age flood or Missoula flood floods, but it's much smaller than that. So here's um, today's uh, landscape on the left. Today's Puget Lowland between the Olympic Mountains on the we uh, west and the Ca Cascade Range on the east, and you can see the approximate ice limit. And uh, that, by the way, these sketches were done by uh, geologist, hydrologist, mountaineer, and artist. Uh, regional character and awesome person, D. Molinar, who passed away uh, this last year at the age of 101. Wow. And uh, D. was a good friend. He did amazing things. And I just miss him so much. He was so funny also. Uh, but he drew this reconstructed uh, Puget Lobe of the glacier. And you can see that all the rivers from Mount Rainier would have been dammed up and formed lakes on the margin of the ice, the southeast margin right here. And that's just the kind of thing we're going to talk about. And of course, the drainage from under the ice came down through the Black River Valley, uh, what we now call the Black River Spillway, and then out the Chehalis River. So that's 17,000 years ago at glacial maximum. And of course, the glacier modified the Puget Lowland and left this streamlined topography um, 
these large ridges that are created are often called drumlins. Um, sometimes they're called flutes, uh, the valleys between them, and this is sometimes called fluted topography. This is a picture down near McKenna, uh, just north of the Nisqually River near Yelm, the town of Yelm, Washington, uh, east of Olympia, northeast of Olympia. And um, this is State Highway 507 and State Highway 702 coming across here. And you can see it's not, uh, it's not going north and south. That's because uh, once the glacier got south of the, the Olympics, or once the glacier reached sort of the distal end of its path, they actually started to turn. And I, I grew up in Ohio, and the glaciers, uh, the same Ice Age glacier, not the same one exactly, but at the same time as this one, we had a glacier in Northeast Ohio that was doing the same thing. Those, those distal lobes were kind of making a slow turn following the gradient. Okay, so um, this next picture shows uh, that area was right here of the fluted topography, but if you look to the uh, southeast of there, you see a bunch of lakes in this area, the southernmost area of the Puget Lowland, and very deep valleys, and they all cut across the glaciated landscape. And uh, this, by the way, is the Bald Hills of the Cascade Range right here, and the Nisqually River, which empties into Puget Sound. I'm following the Nisqually up the river here, and here's where the Nisqually River meets uh, the Cascade Range near the town of Eatonville, Washington. So here's the mountain front of the Cascade Range, the southernmost part of the Puget Lowland. Uh, Olympia is off on the very northwest corner of this map, and here is this series of valleys that we noticed, and this uh, this is the floodway of the tan wax flood that we're talking about. So here's glacial lake carbon. This is that floodway and those southwest trending channels I was talking about. And I uh, just last week drew a cross section across the channel there. I'll go back. This cross section is right about here. And you can see how deep some of these channels are that were carved when this flood went across this landscape. Uh, this is about uh, 200 feet here, 300, uh, maybe close to 300 feet depth or more, maybe 400 feet in some locations, so 120 meters. Um, so the flood from the lake uh, we know there was at least one big flood and maybe a couple really small ones, but one big one is the one that did most of the erosion. And in the bottoms of some of these valleys, the Ohop Valley and especially the Tanwax Valley, which gives its name to this event, uh, have a debris flow in them, a debris flow deposit. So here's an aerial view I took many years ago when a friend with a fixed wing flew us around the area. And we're looking north here, right by the spillway, and you can see these lakes and the valleys. Here's the Great Ohop Valley, and then here's the Tanwax Valley. Hmm. Now the lakes probably uh, were where the flood was carrying large chunks of ice or perhaps flowing over stagnant ice. So um, about uh, 900 feet elevation, uh, so, and I apologize for mixing up a uh, metric system and, and uh, imperial units here. Uh, on the east, uh, on the, the flanks of uh, Lake Kapausen up here, way above the lake, we had a, oops, I'm ahead of myself, sorry about that. So in the Tanwax Valley, we found a debris flow deposit with large boulders. And if you look at these boulders, you kind of notice something they're all gray, not all, but most of them are this gray color, and that's because they're made of andesite. And you know, most of the rocks that were carried by this Puget lobe and that are left as deposits, glacial erratics and so on, are all kinds of different rock types, mostly igneous and metamorphic because sedimentary rocks tend to get chewed up by the glacier and ground up into bits. But this, this uh, is very distinctive because it's made up of so many rocks from the Cascade Range. So that you might say that the, the fingerprint of this flood is andesite. And that's what allowed us to track it uh, farther downstream. 
way up above Lake Kapausen, over 900 feet elevation, is our giant boulders of andesite. Uh, this is my co-author. We're actually looking southwest in the direction the flow is going. He's pointing back to the origin of the flood. Close-up view of these boulders show they're really bashed up because of a lot of rock-to-rock -rock abrasion that was going on as these boulders were clanging and hitting each other in this flood. But th this is pretty much the high water mark of this flood. Uh, Zoe Futornik, one of the students who worked on this for her bachelor's thesis, found on the very southern margin of uh, Ohop Lake in Ohop Valley, this great debris flow deposit. This is, a, this is a mud flow. This is that mud flow, the same one I showed a few slides ago, uh, full of these giant andesite boulders carried by this uh, event. Uh, a lot of the andesites came from the Mount Rainier the rocks, also from ancient rocks, uh, ancient deposits of Mount Rainier material uh, that are up that way. This is a guy's front yard, you know, Mr. Clement's front yard. He lives north uh, northwest of Eatonville on the on the west side of the Ohop Valley on the glaciated Puget Lowland. This is uh, these are all boulders from his front yard. They weren't deposited in exactly this way, but he had them pushed them all over into piles. Uh, and this is the kind of thing you see along this floodway. Here uh, is a uh, person's a residence uh, along Highway Seven in the Ohop Valley. And we jokingly always call this Stonehenge because they put these giant andesite boulders all in a giant sort of semicircular array. Uh, we also found uh, in one, and I think there's one more location where we see uh, what we think are mega ripples in gravel soils. Uh, these are, I don't know, three, four, five meters in height. And this is also in the Tanwax Valley. So looking up the Ohop Valley again, uh, farther down, just upstream of Yelm in the Deschutes area. The Deschutes River is off to the right over by this red barn. That's the Deschutes Valley. And up on the uh, left bank or south bank of the Deschutes River is a rather enormous bar full of andesite rocks. That's Barry looking at it. Uh, and this is what he's looking at. Uh, they had excavated across the bar. I don't know if they were putting in uh, some kind of telephone line or some kind of sewer system or something, but you can see these large boulders that were pulled out of the excavation. Most of those boulders are andesites. So this bar was a depositional feature, a landform produced by this flood as it was coming down from uh, the Cascade Range. And you see similar bars on a much grander scale uh, produced by the great Ice Age Missoula floods. Off at Lake, also along the path of the floodway, they have taken the boulders and put them to use as uh, large cobbles and boulders in the building of walls and this fireplace here. And in Tonino, across from the grocery store, uh, if you've been there, you see all these boulders all over the place. I have a friend that lives in Tonino, his entire backyard is boulders like this. And again, these are almost all andesite rocks in the path of this floodway. Uh, it turns out that this led us to the Mima Mounds. And the Mima Mounds sit on the same strat stratigraphic horizon as this flood, which is the one of the highest late glacial terraces. And this is a close-up of a root throw, of a, excuse me, a wind throw trees root ball in Rocky Prairie, this isn't in the Mima Mounds, in Rocky Prairie, and you can see that the texture of these stones, they're distributed in a matrix, and I, that to me is a classic debris flow deposit. And that's my uh, a student, Isaac, Centralia College student, Isaac there, who was, uh, we were basically doing a project to see if we could find out uh, what the concentration of andesite rocks is in the Mima Mounds and in Rocky Prairie, and so far, uh, our results show that it's about 85% andesite rocks in the Mima Mounds at Rocky Prairie and farther downstream in this floodway, it's about fit, roughly 45 or 50% in the Mima Mounds. Uh, here's the texture of a Mima Mound that shows you that debris flow texture, uh, large stones suspended in the middle of a finer matrix, and then here's 
one of the Mima mounds. Uh, and then the Mima mounds themselves sit on a gravelly water laid deposit. Okay, so let's uh, look a little bit more closely at the flood itself diagrammatically. Uh, the Puget lobe of the ice came down. Uh, maximum lake level was probably, possibly even up 1,700 feet elevation. Um, and so you had the ice damming up the water as, it, as the glacier reached the Cascade Range rocks over on the east margin of the Puget Lowland. Um, we know there was a lake up the Carbon River Valley, and this is uh, uh, a very bad copy of Rocky Crandall's geologic map taken from his surficial geology of the Lake Taps Quadrangle um, that just shows a portion of the map. And this shows the, uh, the Puget Lowland, or actually the, uh, the Fox Creek Channel that I'll talk about is up here in the northeast corner. This is a drainage channel. Uh, and this is where, basically where the glacier met the rocks of the Cascade Range. Here is the river of uh, the, the glaciated valley of the Carbon River Valley. And of course, this valley uh, was carved by an Ice Age glacier that headed on Mount Rainier at an ice cap and scoured out a huge glacial, U shaped glacial valley that we know as the Carbon River Valley today. And Rocky, way up south of, if you've been up that valley, you know where the Fairfax Bridge is up here. Way up past there are lots of lake deposits that were mapped by Rocky Crandall. And uh, we lost Rocky about 10 years ago as well. So again, here's a, uh, a portion of a map that was in Rocky's paper, superimposed on some shaded relief. And you can see the lake, this actually, under, I made this, uh, I made this uh, tracing of the lake probably 25 years ago. And it really, I think, understates the size of the lake as based on the deposits I just showed you. But anyway, uh, there was a lake at the mac glacial maximum that extended back. And then next, between the ice and the Cascade Range, you had a deposit called a came, which is where sediments carried by meltwaters along the margin of the glacier fill in a cavity or a, a, a low spot next to the ice. So the, the interesting thing about these cames and came deltas is they tell you, they instruct on the level of the water that's impounded by the ice. And so just like a delta, they tell you the elevation of the lake uh, that the delta is being deposited into. So here is a deposit of a came mapped by Rocky Crandall at the glacial maximum. And then here's, so here, so we know some of the lake drained out to a slightly lower level and it formed this first came. And then there was a second level of the lake and uh, it formed a much lower came terrace that marks that second level. And that drop, that was quite a substantial drop, well over 50 meters. And we think that drop and that emptying of the lake is possibly what carved out most of the valleys. So here is where the lake was again. This is a LIDAR image from the State uh, Geologic Survey. And you can see that um, this is the outlet channel here. It's called Fox Creek. Uh, the Puget Lowland is about another mile or two off the diagram to the left here. But uh, the lake, which was really a network of lakes next to the ice that included this lake in the Great Carbon River Valley, drained as it floated the glacier, drained through this uh, channel next to the Cascade Range. And when it did, it unleashed a lot of landslides. And I've got another cl slightly closer view here that shows these landslides. So the water is coming through here. And this giant embayment here is about one mile long about 2,000 feet wide. And you can see a lot of other landslides here. Here's a giant one here. Here's another large landslide, another large landslide, um, another landslide here. And remember, this is 2,000 feet. So these are substantial landslides. And all this rock, is this rock is largely andesitic. It includes some really old andesites, but it's largely andesitic in character. So I think this is where the andesites are coming from all the Mount Rainier rivers coming through here and the Mount Rainier rocks from these various deposits. So farther downstream, uh, this is a, 
uh, a diagram from J. Harlan Bretz's map uh, from his Bulletin 8, published in 1913, one of the first publications of the State Geologic Survey. And uh, J. Harlan Bretz, by the way, is the geologist who discovered the Missoula floods, but he did not find these floods. He did not see these floods, a little bit too subtle for him to see. So he's, he's very famous for being the person to discover the evidence for the great Missoula floods. And of course he was, uh, uh, people were very, um, ridiculed him for years because they thought this was a crazy idea until finally he was vindicated uh, in the last years of his life when he was in his 90s, took that long. But here we have uh, the area south of Olympia, Washington, um, here is the Black River Spillway. Mo a lot, most of the water from under the Puget Glacier was coming down this valley and down some other valleys. Here's the Deschutes River. And you can see these valleys here that are mapped by, by um, Bretts. And notice this valley in particular, the Deschutes River. All these valleys were the valleys that were carved by this tan wax flood. And, uh, in these valleys are Mima Mounds, and many, almost every one of these valleys has Mima Mounds. Um, but anyway, these are, this is the flood itself coming from east to west, cutting through the moraine, cutting through the glacial deposits in a sort of a cross valley perspective and leaving deposits behind. And here's where uh, the flood came through Tonino, and then it went uh, down through what's Violet Prairie here and also down the Skookumchuck River into the Centralia area and back into the Chehalis again. Okay, here's a, a later stage when the ice has melted back and you can see a glacial Lake Russell present. I'm not sure when this would be. I think this would be sometime after 17,000 years ago. You can see other cross valleys uh, you can see this Sherlock Delta, which is in the Nisqually Valley, very near the uh, Nisqually tribal lands, and the Stilicum Delta. These are enormous deltas. Both of these were deposited by floods at, that happened after our Tanwax flood, but also these floods came from Glacial Lake Puyallup emptying. So our flood was not the only one. Here's a diagram also from, uh, this is from Robert Thorson who did his PhD on the, the Puget Lobe of the gl Glacier. And he shows the orientation and position of the Puget Lobe at the maximum of Glacial Lake Russell. Uh, and at this point, the water was still draining down into the, the Black Lake Spillway and out the Chehalis River. And then later, at some point in time, maybe after 16,000 years ago, question mark, uh, finally, when the glacier had melted back enough to allow water to drain north into the Straits of Juan de Fuca, then you had Lake Russell drainage and you had Lake Bretts forming against the ice at this point. So at this point, there's essentially no water coming down into the Chehalis anymore. And when this time is, when the transition is between Lake Russell and Lake Bretts, Bretts that, as far as I know, isn't exactly known yet. This is a timeline from Ralph Hagerud uh, that looks from north on the left to south, and you can see kilometers here. Um, and you can see here's time on the left axis. And 12,000 years ago, these are probability curves, by the way, uh, for calendric ages, calibrated radiocarbon ages. Um, that determine where the glacier is at certain times. So you can see that the evidence that the glacier reached uh, its farthest point around 16,995 years ago, according to Steve Porter and Terry Swanson. And so that's its maximum. It didn't last very long, maybe two centuries at its maximum. The ice would have extended down close to Rochester, Washington. Uh, we know it got at least to Maytown. And then, so it came down rapidly, maybe two centuries maximum, and then it, re, and then it retreated rapidly. Of course, it, the glacier didn't move backwards, it just stagnated, and then the glacial terminus would have been farther and farther to the, to the north again. And again, this is uh, courtesy of Ralph Hagerud at the U.S. Geological Survey. 
So what I did uh, this week was I went into, um, you know that when we have radiocarbon dates, uh, we have to calibrate them because when we get a radiocarbon date back, we have a raw date from the laboratory that is basically the ratio of carbon-14. It's based on the half-life of radiocarbon, 5,730-year half-life. And it's uh, showing us the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12 and basically telling us how much carbon, uh, how much of that uh, daughter product, or excuse me, how much of the radiocarbon-14 is left based on an assumed standard for how much carbon-14 there is. But, um, but we know that uh, the radiocarbon in the atmosphere, the carbon-14, is modulated by an interaction of the Earth's geomagnetic field, cosmic ray flux, and also the solar wind. So you have these three things acting in concert uh, that, that sort of change how much carbon-14 is made. And then you also have the circulation of the carbon-14 in the atmosphere and the oceans. So uh, starting in the mid-80s, the radiocarbon labs started creating calibration curves where they would take individual pieces of carbonaceous material, run them for a very long time to get a very precise date. And if essentially what they did was build back in time a curve that shows, uh, it's called the calibration curve, but it's showing us how much carbon-14 is in the atmosphere at any given time. And so these days when we get a radiocarbon date, and here's the raw age from the laboratory on the left, we take it over to the calibration curve and including the error, and then we have to run that down to the calendric age. And you can see that there is, for example, if you have a lab age about 18,000 years old, the calendric age is actually 2,000 years older, 20,000 years. So that's why you sometimes see a disparity uh, between the actual lab age and the calibrated radiocarbon age. We're most interested in these calibrated ages right here because these are the ones that are most accurate in terms of timing, right? Um, so this is the new curve, which came out literally three weeks ago, it was published. And luckily uh, the OxCal and Calib software programs now online have the new, um, the new calibration data embedded in them already. So, and if anybody needs those, um, those links to those labs, I can uh, send them to you or uh, give them to, to, um, to Dale. So anyway, what I did was I took the new calibration curve here and I plotted some of the dates we know. We know that ice covered Seattle, according to Ralph Hagerud and all the dates that the USGS has analyzed between about 17,500 and 16,000 years ago. Uh, we know that the Puget Lode maximum, and I'm going by the dates on the bottom here, the Puget Lode maximum was at Olympia area sometime around 17,000 years ago, and it lasted about two centuries. Uh, sometime after that, and we don't know exactly when because we haven't dated the flood by radiocarbon, we had our Tanwax flood as the glacial lake carbon floated the ice of the uh, retreating Puget Lobe and flooded through the South Puget Lowland. Uh, and then sometime after that, as the ice retreated a bit farther, we had Glacial Lake Russell. And notice that the, um, that, notice that the, through the extent of this arrow, the water is still coming out through the Chehala spillway. And uh, Derek Booth of the University of Washington, uh, he's now down at Santa Barbara in the Earth Sciences Department there, but he had calculated that the average uh, annual outwash was one times 10 to the 11 cubic meters uh, annually, and that comes down to about 3,170 cubic meters per second, or 112,000 cubic feet per second average discharge. And by the way, the great flood of, of record of 2007 on the Chehalis River was about 80,000 cubic feet per second. So take that flood, multiply it by, uh, add 50% to it, and run it down the Chehalis River, and that's on average, what would have been going down the Chehalis River at that time. Uh, of course, you had times when there was probably not much water and times when you had even greater flow, uh, but you had a lot of water moving through that, that valley. But the magic time would be when Lake Russell drained north into Lake Bretts and the drainage started going out into the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Uh, 
And notice the manna site is after that. And of course, this is, a, this is the time when we have lots of opportunities uh, for movement along these channels. I will also add the sea level curve, uh, also borrowed from Ralph Haggard's slideshow. And notice that at about uh, 12,000, at, at the time of the Manus Mastodon, let's say right over in here, we were still down about 70 meters lower than today, sea level, which is very interesting to contemplate. So at maximum, uh, maximum glaciation, we had a sea level of almost 120 meters lower than today. Uh, our sea level would have been about 40 kilometers offshore from uh, Grays Harbor. Our, our shoreline would have been about 40, 40 kilometers out there. So about uh, what, 20 some, uh, 25, 26 miles. And here's the period of the Vashon glaciation. Why didn't it take place during the time of the peak uh, Pleistocene glaciation? Because it took a long time for that lobe of Puget ice to kind of creep down here. So it's kind of like a kinematic wave slowly creeping down here. Like think of it as kind of a slinky spring of ice coming down through through uh, Washington. Okay, so um, in summary, we had the Puget Low blocking the, the waters from Mount Rainier and uh, other rivers and creating a, a network of lakes along the margin. Those, we know that those lakes uh, rushed out and formed a large flood at the margin of the ice. Uh, it carved many valleys, left deposits and landforms as well. We don't really know how far it went. We've tracked it as far as the, as the Mima Mounds into Centralia. Um, but I think the interesting thing about this flood is it's certainly not a deal breaker in terms of the movement of peoples through, uh, through these areas of the Chehalis Valley. Um, uh, but uh, it did also create pathways by erosion. It created interesting valleys and pathways and help modify the landscape. Um, and so even if you did have water and early arrivals coming down here, there still would have been ways to get up into the upper Chehalis Basin, uh, down through what's now Brooklyn or other areas. Uh, and then certainly after the flood was over and after Lake Russell drained, you could have come up this reamed out valley, which was ripe and ready for people to, to move through. So another thing too that is interesting is that the areas of the Mima Mounds uh, created by this flood are created excellent habitat too, right? Created prairie habitat uh, that was also optimum for people to move through. So I, I think that the flood is, uh, it, it's an obstacle at the time of the flood, but then later it allows the creation of pathways by erosion, uh, travel, travel corridors, and also creates habitat. So uh, there are a number of um, posters and publications about this. Uh, I forgot to mention that Ken Tabbitt at Evergreen has been studying the Mima Mounds and has found, uh, he's been studying the shape and aspect ratio of the Mima Mounds using LIDAR and uh, it's kind of like a personal research project he's been passionate about for a few years now. And uh, he's found that the Mima Mounds are elongated parallel to the valleys they're in, which implies to him a type of flowage phenomenon. And, I, and that fits in with our flood, flood theory quite well. Uh, again, we're mainly, Barry and I are mainly interested in the sediment in the Mima Mounds. We, we know where that came from. It's part of this flood. And, but we think Ken's interpretation of the shape of the Mima Mounds adds uh, another piece of evidence that in favor of that flood. So anyway, that's the end of my presentation. I hope I wasn't talking too fast. And um, if I haven't put you to sleep, I will gladly uh, take questions. And by the way, Steve Hackenberger, uh, nice to see your name out there if you're still there. And, um, you know, sud hey, so did you stop? 
<clears throat> stop sharing. Oh, no, wait a minute. I, I stopped sharing. Can you still hear me? We can, it just says the end of slideshow, so I think you're still sharing. Oh, I see. Okay, so something's wrong. I'm not in the meeting anymore, and I'm not sure what's going on here. Oh, we see you. Yeah. Dale, can you, oh, wait, here we go. Here we go. Um, yeah, we see you, and uh, so. Can you stop sharing for me? Oh, can I? I can't I figure out I, how to do it. I think it's stopped now because it's just flashing between you and Dale. Okay. Anything I need to do, Matt? No, it should be all set. I did uh, stop sharing for, uh, for Pat. All right. Hey, thanks a lot, Matt. Appreciate it. Okay. Questions. Uh, he did, we're, we're certainly doing well for time. Uh, you know, we, we probably have 15 minutes for questions without too much trouble. And we have some people involved that might have some. Uh, I'm going to, by the way, send you a great poster that I copied in a, uh, that, that Pat and his uh, colleague put together for a presentation, which has a, uh, a lot of this information on one piece of uh, paper on a poster, and I'll send you those bibliographic uh, references that he showed at the end as well. So, questions? Hey, this is Ryan. I've, I've got a question. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Uh, so, uh, just kind of looking at the same vein and uh, the potential correlation between stem points and these river channels. Um, I was curious, uh, I know that there's been some similar stem points found up on the South Thompson River near Kamloops in that area. I've seen some studies and um, I know as the ice, sheet, ice sheets obviously receded north. I was curious if there's a, a sense of how rapidly that may have moved and how that may impact the, you know, overall hypothesis. So obviously knowing that those existed up there, people were moving north with the moving ice. Um, so there's just a question more about the timing of the geology and the, the recession of the ice sheets. Right, well, and you know, the, I don't, I'm, I'm not too familiar with how far it got uh, to cross the 49th parallel, uh, exactly when that happened. But I do know that during the Younger Dryas, right, which is about 12,900 years ago, 13,000 years ago, roughly, you had a re-advance of the glacier, and it actually got as far as Bellingham. It came back down uh, the, the, the valley of what's now Johnson Creek on the west side of American Sumas Mountain, and it actually dammed up the Nooksack River because when I was doing field mapping up there, I found a delta at 300 and a little over 300 feet elevation uh, near the town of Cedarville, if you know where that's at. Um, and that delta was where the, uh, created by a stream coming off the ice, which was in the, Su in the uh, Johnson Creek Valley, west of Sumas Mountain going, and the water was flowing to the east into what I call Lake Nooksack. Um, so that, I'm not sure exactly how long that lake lasted there, but the terminus of the ice was somewhere around or north of just north of Bellingham at that point. So that's interesting because that's very close in time to the Manus Mastodon. And um, one thing, uh, there's some interesting books after the Ice Age or after the ice uh, that talk about, um, you know, after the ice, you had lots of vegetation and you of course had large animals following the vegetation north along the margin of the ice. And so who was following the large animals uh, that were following the ice, you know, um, it, hungry people. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, I don't know if I answered your question there, Ryan, but I, I can look into that. Um, Doug Clark up at Western Washington University and, um, and John Clegg at Simon Fraser University, those two have been working on this re-advance of the ice during the uh, what used to be called the Sumas glaciation, but I think it's uh, it's it's the same time as the Younger Dryas. So it, it's a phenomenon of this again re-entering a cold period, 
called the Younger Dryas and the glaciers start advancing again. And of course, after that episode, then we rapidly, uh, the ice rapidly retreated and, and it warmed up. Yeah, no, that's, that's helpful. Appreciate the additional insight. So if you, uh, if you email me and I'll type my email address into the, or actually Dale can give you my email. Dale, you can just give him either my Centralia College or my Buried Forest address. Either one is fine. Okay. And you can email me and I'll try to, uh, if I hear from, from John and, and Doug Clark up at Western and Simon Fraser, I can ask them what the latest is on, on that glacier. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. So I'll, I'll send it to you, Ryan. Uh, the 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 drainage of uh, Lake Brits, Lake uh, Russell. Uh, you know, it, it, it. I hear that the the lake dropped 100 to 150 feet. Um, that would opened up a lot of uh, drawdown clear areas for vegetation and uh, probably attractive to. Uh, uh, so the megafauna we're talking about. Uh, mm -hmm. oh, is there a quick drop like that? And that would have left quite a exposed uh, draw, drawdown Ralph, area. Ralph, Ralph Hagerud of the U.S. Geological Survey has really been analyzing the, the landscape of the Puget Lowland with LIDAR. And for years, he's been studying the deglaciation and the landforms, uh, you know, formed by deglaciation. So he would be the one to know that. And I, you know, I have it. It would be interesting. I wonder if he actually has some publications out on this now. I don't think he's written a paper on this, but he may have uh, written some abstracts on this topic. And so I'll, I'll kind of dig into that and see what he's what he's what, done. What's his and name again for time? Ralph Ralph Hagerud, H A U G E R. U D. H A U G E R U D. Hagerud. Oh, okay. Ralph. Yeah, that would be a good one for uh, for Ken and Tyler to take a close look at. Ken may have seen it. And by the way, um, the State Geological Survey, uh, which used to be called the DNR Division of Earth Sciences, is now called Washington Geological Survey. It's still a part of the of the Department of Natural Resources, but they um, they have an amazing web page with lots of lidar, uh, 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 geologic maps that you can uh, zoom into. Uh, it's kind of a pseudo GIS situation, and in their library, they have a um, bibliographic search function that allows you to use you know Boolean. Uh, type parameters to, to search for different authors and different uh, topics and even different areas on the geology of Washington. It's just, it's one of the most amazing uh, resources I've ever seen. And, you know, uh, this was going on when I was there, but it's even better now because of all the digital information. And mm -hmm. they've tried to make it a point to have every, you know, geologic, all pieces of geologic information on Washington are in that library as far as they know. Um, so you can web search Washington Geological Survey and, and get there um, pretty easily. Uh, what else? Um, oh, also uh, at the, um, the state survey, if you look for publications, they keep a PDF document updated on their publications list, which includes various types of publications, including all their maps, they also have a separate maps page, by the way. Uh, all their maps and all the publications of the State Geologic Survey are basically digitized. So they're all, like the Brett's diagrams I showed you. Uh, you can go right online and look at the original Brett's uh, publications right online. So it's a great resource. Other questions? By the way, the uh, steam eruption that's behind me, or the ash and gas eruption, is uh, a picture I took in April 16th, 1983, back when the lava dome was much smaller. Wow. I'll, I'll lean over so you can see it. It was either that or you'd be seeing all my books uh, in my office. 
Yeah, we have s similar messes. Uh, I I would. Uh, it's the sign of an active uh, mind. Interested, interested in the Missoula floods, and we have David Rice on on board too. And I would say that kind of flooding clear up the Willamette to to Eugene and so forth would clean the slate of or <laughs> deeply bury archaeological materials from any first peoples uh, in that um, in that you know, coming in in that region. And that's usually where people point to, not the Chehalis. Of course, we have the Tamax flood, but it's not nearly as massive. Uh, and like you say, it could create a, could have created some uh, advantages for movement. Uh, David's worked a lot up in the Columbia and up that area. Do you want to add anything, David, to that? As far as the cleaning the slate and not finding sites up there? Can, I think you're unmuted. Can you hear me? David? Oh, he just disappeared. Anyway, that's too bad because he would certainly have something to say. Huh. See here? I guess not, but uh, I guess just in general, the the reason we're another reason we're looking here instead of the you know like a lot of people do look at the columbia i think it was a goner as far as uh archaeological sites surviving that kind of erosion uh maybe steve has something he could add to that uh hackenberger if he unmutes can you hear us he's probably grading papers he seems to be there oh here we go something Oh, okay. <laughs> right. Anyway, I guess we're not hearing Steve. Any other uh, question? But I guess you would agree that the erosion from Missoula would have been horrendous, or the burying of burying of any sites. Uh, where in our area, the Tamax uh, would have been a, a observed potentially, as we're seeing dates. Uh, if you were near high ground, could you have gotten out of there, do you think? If you heard it, like you heard the line well, it, it depends where you were. You mean the Missoula floods or the Tanawax flood? No, the no, Missoula would be pretty... Oh, yeah. I, boy, I, I don't know. It, I, I think a lot of you luck would... see would, it coming, but... <laughs> I think a lot of luck would be involved in that. Um, yeah. Okay, I'm looking for... But people could survive, you know, if they were in the right position. Uh, in it and not trying to fill their uh, uh, their uh, you know uh, manage jars so anyway uh, I have yeah a question. so any uh, idea oh John yeah I was wondering just where the uh, where the debris dam or whatever it was that stopped the uh, the flow in the Missoula floods but that forced the water down into the Willamette uh, Basin? Uh, the, um, the constriction, it was hydraulic damming. And the hydraulic dam was a subtle one, but it was very near uh, Kalama, Washington. Um, there's a narrowing of the, right where the old Trojan nuclear power plant used to be. That's a very narrow spot there in the Columbia. And so right. it was uh, not a dam, it was a, it was a narrowing that created kind of a nozzle effect. And that narrowing uh, accomplished what you call hydraulic damming. And um, so that's what caused it to back flood all the way down to Eugene. So it was roughly 400 feet deep in the Portland Basin. And of course, uh, a lot of geologists like Jim O'Connor have uh, studied the deposits of the Missoula floods uh, by looking in gravel pits, you know, as far as south as Eugene. In fact, I was on uh, the, the there's a group called the Friends of the Pleistocene, and uh, I've been on a number of their field trips. And uh, one of the Friends of the Pleistocene trips was a, a trip to look at the geology of the Willamette Valley that was led by Jim O'Connor of the USGS and others. And uh, so that's where we saw the evidence for this back flooding. And John, you mentioned. Uh, you mentioned in your question that you typed in about the Deschutes Valley, um, those flutes uh, that you showed on that you saw on the screen were right near the Nisqually Valley. Um, 
the Deschutes Valley uh, water uh, ice. I don't know the, the the ice was damming up part of the Deschutes Valley. So the only part of the Deschutes Valley we saw in my presentation was where that large bar was, which was not too far north of Tonino on the old military road. Okay. So I don't, it, it's kind of easier to look at a map and, and figure out where it is. But it's uh, if you look where mil Military Road crosses over the Nisqually, uh, excuse me, the Deschutes Valley, um, that is where that picture was taken. And so the flood did go through there and the floodway, so yeah, the, the floodway uh, for a while was where the modern Deschutes River is. But then the actual incision of the, pu the present Deschutes River Valley uh, happened at some later time. Ah, thank you. And uh, actually, you know where the state capital is and the state capital campus um, of Washington in Olympia, right. uh, that flat, very flat surface you see there, uh, that is the delta that was built into Glacial Lake Russell by, the, by water coming down the Deschutes Valley at a later time. And the reason I know that is that when they were building the Natural Resources Building, they asked a bunch of us geologists to go in and look at the foundation because they were all worried about earthquakes and liquefaction then. So they wanted us to see what the sediments were that this building we were going to be working in was built up, was going to be built upon. Right. So we went into the excavation and as soon as I looked at the deposits in the excavation, uh, I realized there was a coarsening upward from fine to coarse and it was a classic delta uh, deposit and the top of it is that flat surface where the state capital and the natural resources building are today. And so you could almost think of it if you're walking from the capital to downtown Olympia, you're walking down the front, you're walking down the northern slope of the great delta that was built into Glacial Lake Russell. And uh, interestingly, in the west portion of the part, what's now the parking lot of the Natural Resources Building in Olympia, and in dug in, into these sediments was a peat bog uh, that was, uh, I'm just gonna guess here, about 12, 15 feet thick. And right in the middle of it, you could see the Mazama Tephra. And, <laughs> Uh, at the very bottom, I remember we got a, a twig or a date and it was, you know, near the bottom. It wasn't quite totally at the bottom. It was about 10,000 years. And then at the very top, we had a date of about 600. So, uh, at the, and on top of the peat bog was the fill where they just turned it into a parking lot sometime, wow. you know, earlier in the state's history. I just thought it's pretty amazing. We have a, a, a bog that was, you know, built, that was created on top of the delta formed into, into uh, Glacial Lake Russell. And what we humans do to it is bulldoze it in and create a parking lot on top of it. <laughs> Pat, we did a project to try to relocate Isaac Stevens' original um, governor's mansion that was built. It's just it's a pretty plain building. Uh -huh. But then we found out that in front of the Capitol there, they regraded a lot. You know, huh. these hydraulics. Yeah. So we did not find it because it probably was totally washed out in trying to smooth it out. I wonder what they saw. Yeah. Well, you'd like to be able to go back in time and see what the original landscape looked like. Other questions? Yeah, I had a question for Pat. Hi there. Uh, I'm Doug Ryan. Um, Hi, Doug. My question has to do with, with some sediments, which you may be interested in. Uh, Tom Terry, who's also on the call, and I, I've been working with Tom, putting some shallow groundwater wells in on a capital land trust property on a black ditch, which, or Bloom's Ditch, which is between Scatter Creek and Salmon Creek, about a mile east of the Black River. Uh -huh. And <clears throat> we've put them in over about a hundred, about a hundred acre meadow alongside the, the stream. And under the current um, kind of grassy peat, there's about two feet of, of fine silt, silt and clay on top of about six inches of well-preserved peat 
on top of gravelly, sandy stuff. I'd say <laughs> gravel, what we find is gravel up to about the size of walnuts, I'd say. Mm -hmm. um, would that be the, the, um, the tan wax uh, flood deposit, the gravelly stuff? Well, how deep is this uh, deposit? Um, Oh, well, we, we we're only going down about three feet. So. Uh, yeah, okay, well, here's, the, here's the clue. Um, if you have a lot of little gray andesite pebbles in okay. there, and uh, andesite, I, I neglected to put a picture of andesite. I should have put a close-up picture. Andesite is a gray rock with little white crystals that mm -hmm. look like freckles in it. Um, it's quite gray. Yeah. So if you find little gray rocks, yeah, and you know, it's best to break them open. You okay. know, somebody always says, hey, can you identify this rock? And it's their like special rock. <laughs> and then I say, well, here, give, give me my hammer. And then they <laughs> kind of look at you like, well, wait, 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 that's my special rock. Well, if you want me to look, identify it, you have to break it. We'll send you a sample. <laughs> I've seen a lot of andesite. <laughs> uh, you know, you guys can keep the sample if you want. Okay. Uh -huh. Send me a picture. Okay, okay, we'll do. Okay, my my question is that would seem to imply if the gravelly stuff is is the uh, the tan wax, uh, you know, outwash, that what we had on that site at least was a bog on top of that. Sure. Followed by, followed by a lake. Yeah, I. Some later time. Sure, possibly. So that's just it's it's right in the middle of that that the the black you know the, the prairies in the, the the wet prairie there in, in yeah. the Black River Basin. Mm -hmm. Well, I wonder if um, is it in a low area that would have trapped water? You know, sometimes you have yes. little block, blocks of ice, little mm -hmm. blocks of ice that were carried by the flood, and of course that leaves behind a little kettle uh, where the ice melted away, and you could have had the flood deposit underneath the kettle. Um, I'm sure off the lake is one of those features. Mm -hmm. um, this is a broad, flat, really broad, flat area, however, yeah, it, where, where these sediments are. Yeah, I'd like to see uh, you know, the latitude, longitude, the location of it. Maybe yeah, you can I'll, I'll, yeah, I can send you, we'll send you some, info, you know, the location sure. and the aerial photo. Yeah. So you can get a reference and that would be really helpful for us. Absolutely, would love to do it. Yeah. Doug, Doug, I'll send, uh, Doug, I'll send you uh, Patrick's emails too. Okay, thank you. The pictures. <laughs> so you can... mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I just like to say it's a great presentation, a great format, and I'm glad to, to join in and um, hopefully others that do this. It's so great to be able to do this and uh, not have to travel. <laughs> right. So. Well, yeah, thank that, you. And like I say, like some some people haven't been with us for years, but stay members, so it's great to see them. Uh, also, uh, 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 you know, it, it also keeps it under time because people would be driving home for an hour now, too, or more, you know, from Seattle. Mm -hmm. um, so we, I think this works. And we have 37 at the, the highest, 37 people audience, which is wonderful. Um, and... Uh, do and one of the things you know make sure you're, please do make sure your uh, membership's current and we we certainly want to honor people that are um you know been with us for a couple of years but it'd be great if you could help do this um steve steve just said thanks and uh any any we probably have time for maybe one more or maybe two questions if there's anything else people wanted to bring up in a I guess David Rice, unfortunately, we haven't been able to get him to be on audio. Uh, he certainly would add a lot. Um, any other questions? Hey, Ryan. this is Ryan. Oh, Ryan, please. Hey, uh, one last question. So just going back to the depth of the deposition over laying that flood, um, I know it's gonna vary a lot based on the topography and how far out you are from the origin of the flood, but generally speaking, how deep under the current soil level do you find those sediments? Because it seems like that would have some implication for the depth of any potential archeological sites that are, you know, along the margins of the flood channel. Hopefully right. that makes so, sense. So, so closer to the Cascade Range, the flood was pretty erosive. 
uh, you know, carving tens and tens of meters down into the low. I mean, if you go out and drive on Highway 7, the Mount Rainier Highway, uh, you know, if you headed over east from uh, the town of Yelm and hit Highway 7 and then headed south, that huge valley you drop into is the Tanwax Valley, which is the type locality of this flood. And that is a big, that whole valley was scoured out by the flood. In fact, if you go to Northwest Trek over there on off Highway 161, uh, and I remember at one time I gave a talk for the woodworkers uh, group out there. They had their meeting out there. And so while I was out there, I rode the train around, you know, the trolley or whatever they call it, the tram. And there, the, uh, that's where the flood actually surrounded some of these drumlins, these streamlined features that the glacier had. But you could see these large boulders of andesite all over the place that were carried there by the flood, right at Northwest Trek. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, but as you go farther to the downstream in terms of this flood, in other words, to the west and south, then you start getting a lot of deposits because this flood was eroding, but also picking up sediment, right? It was bulking up on sediment while it was coming down. And so uh, I was in a gravel pit down off old uh, Highway 99, north of Tonino, between Tonino and Olympia. And there were huge, what are called forset beds, these dipping beds. Uh, and those were, forset beds are created in a deltaic environment. And these were, had huge rocks and cobbles in them. And so they were, it was a huge flood of material that accumulated very fast. And I don't know how deep it was, but the gravel pit uh, maybe was 50, 60 feet deep at the time I was in there. And we weren't at the bottom of this flood. And I'm sure that that was part of the flood deposit was this deltaic layer of dipping sediments um, that we call forset beds. Um, so in answer to your question, Ryan, like you say, it varies. The Mima mounds around there even uh, the rocks under the Mima Mounds at Mima, Mima Prairie, uh, the ones we could identify right underneath there uh, were rich in andesite too, so we think they're part of the same flood. Uh, but the problem is when you get over there in the Black River Valley, you're also where the water from the Puget Lobe is coming down, so it's really hard to determine which, you know, what's going on because you had two floods of water coming together there. So yeah. Um, that, no, that's helpful. Uh, so, curious, so I don't um, really know the answer to that, nor do I know uh, the, the actual discharge and velocity of this. We haven't been able to figure that out. I'd love to find a run-up area where you had Mima mounds up a slope of some, in some way. Because using run-up, uh, you can get a rough idea of the velocity. Hmm. Yeah. No, that's great. And about how much uh, modern deposition or it sits on top of those mounds is it you know two or three feet down before you actually hit the the flood discharge sediment no the the, the mounds themselves are the sediment and okay uh, that profile of the mound that you saw is um they, they used to let us go in the dnr gravel pit which is off of bordeaux road which is by the way where they had one of the recent fires uh, that people were worried about so i haven't been over there recently to see if the fire impacted that area. Um, but actually, the, the fire, there was a home right next to there, so I hope it didn't. But um, that they would stopped letting us go in the gravel pit that the DNR had used for years. So, um, and this is on land adjacent to the Mima, Mima Mounds Natural Area Preserve. So they, we finally begged them to dig a trench that we could take students into. So that's what that place was. It was a trench into the prairie that exposes a Mima mound in cross section. And so uh, that was where I took that picture and you can actually see, you know, most of the Mima mound. And the Mima mound there is maybe a meter in thickness uh, of organic material and then gravelly, you know, water laid stuff underneath it. So, and I don't know how thick the gravelly stuff is there, at least uh, 20 feet thick maybe. Judging by what I see in the gravel pit. Right. Good to know. Thank you. Any questions you just have to ask? Because we yeah, perhaps... yeah. I, Patrick, I you can disabuse me of a of a nutty uh, sort of a theory that I had after 
I was defrosting uh, a large industrial freezer with with a fan, and I and uh, I noticed that uh, where the ice in this thing that at the on the upper part of the freezer was was melting from the from the air pushing in uh, underneath it that it made it like a, a like the roof kind of an icy roof of a of a cave sort of and uh, and there were discrete points underneath that ice where the uh, where the water was coming down and it was it was uh, I don't know it was probably had something to do with maybe surface tension of the water might be involved with this but but there was definitely a pattern of uh, and I was thinking what if if the glacier the glacier had melted like that same way like it had melted down low but it it over it had a huge overhang sticking out for you know a, maybe a few miles even up above where the you know where the where the silt and the water was coming down and being deposited out of the uh, out of the ice of the of the glacier and uh, that it would have possibly uh done what I was seeing in a miniature there where there were these discrete points where the water always dripped from underneath that uh, that uh, sheet of ice there from as it thawed out. To form the Mima Mounds? Is yeah. that what you're talking about? Yeah. Well, John, we could add that to the many theories, uh, hypotheses, I guess you'd actually call them, uh, of the Mima Mounds. Thanks. <laughs> Should we just call it? Should we just call it the drip theory? Sure. <laughs> did you photograph? Did you film it? But the uh, that's easily replicate them. Um, thanks, John, and and uh, I'm going to also uh, uh, take a look at andesite to see if it was being uh, selected for some of these early traditions for their stone tools. You know for purposely sought out and uh and i'll work with uh with uh scott williams uh for one on that and uh, i'm sure dave rice has an idea so working together on all this i think it uh really gifts us a long ways this really shows us a lot about the main drainage we're hypothesizing is the place and what they would have uh what they would have encountered and experienced I think we're on a, the right track, and I like the ability to do this, uh, you know, in terms of uh, uh, like a quaternary study where we can look at all kinds of aspects. So down the road, we hope to have Ken and Tyler on on GIS and some work on what we're finding in terms of megafauna. Megafauna, how it behaved probably is very much how we're going to find uh, you know where people found these resources and uh, were attracted to them in a big way, and probably had a gr huge, you know, wonderful quality of life because of that. So I uh, do want to thank you and thank you, Pat, for uh, taking the the effort to make to make um, make this you know come together. We've had a lot of practice sessions, and our president Matt Barkley he had a lot of behind the scene work on this, and. Uh, uh, it, it came together really well. I think this works really well. Uh, and uh, David just said he was eager to speak, uh, I guess. Anyway, he tried to speak, but he couldn't be heard. And anyway, he, he agrees the scab land floods would have probably cleaned the slate or certainly had a huge impact. Uh, so thanks everybody for coming aboard. Is everybody, uh, you know, if you look down, you have a little reaction button. So let's hit the applause. Uh, you, you see that on the lower right of your ears? <laughs> there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we really appreciate uh, uh, this time and, and uh, we look forward. We can, we can, like I say, bring in people from all over the place. So if you have ideas, if you have ideas for speakers, please let me know uh, who that might be, because if they're willing to work like Pat did, we can have a beautiful uh, idea of what's being done in our region, particularly the Chehalis drainage. 
Okay, well, well okay, thanks thank again. You. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Yes, thanks, Pat. Thanks, Martha. And, uh, and thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.